Hi, today we're going to be talking about equity, redraw, cash out, and maybe mention uh, offset accounts. And I'm joined with um, Tammy, who's asking the questions today. So, hey, Tammy, how are you doing? Hi, I'm well, thanks, Max. How are you? Always good, yeah. What, what, what's the question for the day? Well, recently I've been hearing a lot about redraw, cash out, and equity release. I'm just super confused. I don't know really what any of it means. Right, okay. Um, so let's start off with the equity piece. Um, and I'm gonna give use an example on the way through of, uh, of two people. We're gonna call them Amy and Lucas, um, where they're in the same situation but facing uh, different choices, or the same choice but doing it in a different way. And so for both of them, we're gonna assume that they bought a property for around $500,000 a couple of years ago. It's now worth $700,000 but they both like to buy a property for a million dollars, okay? Right. Now the property they currently own is worth $700,000 and the mortgage on that property is currently sitting at around $350,000, okay? Right. Yep. Now if their property is worth 700, but their loan is 350, then the difference between those two is their equity. So 700 minus 350 is 350. So they've each got $350,000 in equity. Right, so yeah. that's what equity is. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, that makes sense. Great. Now we need to dif differentiate, differentiate between equity and usable equity. Okay? okay. So the equity that you've got is only usable if you can turn it into cash in some way. And this. Okay. And there's two ways to do that. So let's assume that Lucas decides that he's going to sell his property to get the equity out. And so if he sells his property for $700,000, in theory, he would get $350,000 back, except that in practice, he's gonna to have to pay a real estate agent probably around $15,000, which gives him about $335,000 in, in cash after he sells the property. Okay, yeah. Now, if he wants to buy a property for a million dollars, then he's got $350,000, sorry, $335,000 to use as the deposit. Um, and his deposit on his million dollar property is probably $200,000 would be 20%. There's costs of about 45 grand, so that's about $245,000. Yeah. He's got 335, so he would have about $90,000 left over, which means he yeah. could either get a $90,000 smaller loan, or he could take the extra funds and put them in an offset account or available in redraw to use for something else. Oh, okay. Um, now, we would always recommend doing that just simply because you don't know what's gonna happen in life. So uh, Lucas could lose his job, there could be a global pandemic, where everyone gets shut down for a while. Um, some, he might need repairs on a property or something. So it's always handy to have access to that money. But what we don't want to do is start squandering it on, uh, on silly expensive cars or anything like that because then he's just losing his equity position. Right, of course. Okay. Now, of course, if he buys a million dollar property with an $800,000 loan, his equity is now only 200000 and he's got $90,000 available, so that means his total now is 290. So he's, he's actually lost money on the way through, but that's part and parcel of um, buying property. Right. Now, Amy, on the other hand, uh, is faced with the same decision, but she would like to keep that first property as an investment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, her property is worth $700,000, and banks love to lend 80%. Well, 80% of $700,000 is $560,000. Yep. So if she applied for a loan for $560,000 when she only owes 350, dollars that extra $210,000 is called cash out. Right, okay. So normally we would do that as a separate loan so that you get $350,000 of the existing loan and then a new loan for two hundred and ten, dollars and that's because they've got a different tax purpose. The, oh, okay. the $350,000 was used to buy that first property, which is going to be an investment and therefore it's tax deductible. The 210 dollars is going to be used for the new place and therefore it's not deductible. Right, okay. Okay. Now, 
to buy that million dollar property, she really needs $200,000 deposit plus $45,000 um, to cover costs, which is 245, and she's only got 210. So she's gonna be a bit short. Now she could either borrow a bigger percentage of the million dollar property and pay lender's mortgage insurance on that, or she could buy a bigger, borrow a bigger percentage of the smaller property, the lower value property, and, and pay lender's mortgage insurance on that. Now, generally speaking, the lender's mortgage insurance will be lower on the cheaper property, but obviously she won't get a, a, enough out. And so she could crank that up to 88%. 88% when lender's mortgage insurance is added on is just under 90, and that's a, a good amount without overspending on LMI. Now, 88% of 700 is $616,000. So she owes 350, she takes the loan up to 616. 616 minus 350 is 266,000. So now she's got enough to cover the deposit plus the costs and still have around $21,000 left over at the end to cover her eventualities like losing a job, going through COVID or, or having house repairs. Oh, okay. Okay, so they've both achieved their goal. The difference is now Amy has been able to hold on to both properties. She hasn't had to pay the selling agent cost, um, but she has had to pay some lender's mortgage insurance, which is likely to be a lot lower than the selling agent cost. And of course, if both properties rise, she's now got two properties growing instead of only the one. Right, okay, that makes total sense. And I can't believe it makes that much of a difference just through restructuring. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and by the way, she went through a bank. The bank would probably tell her to just get a giant one million and forty-five thousand dollar loan secured by both properties. Terrible idea. I wouldn't recommend it because then the million and forty-five thousand dollar loan is linked to two properties. And if she wants to sell or refinance in the future, she's going to have to redo everything on both properties again. Um, and it pretty much is great for the bank because it locks her into that bank but it's not so good if she wants to find, you know, a cheaper bank for the investment property uh, and a cheaper bank, bank for the, the owner-occupied property, which might be a, a different bank. Right, okay. So that's what we would recommend. Oh, wow. All right, well, thank you for clarifying that. That makes total sense. Great. Any other questions for now? Um, yeah, I think those, you've answered all my questions for redraw and cash out, but I do have another question. Um, I'm thinking about purchasing a little investment property for myself. I just don't know if now is a good time to buy. What do you think? Uh, that's a whole other big question. I think we should save that for uh, an, another video or another chat. Um, so we'll, we'll make sure that we record that one and post that one later. Um, but yeah, thanks for anyone, everyone watching. Please like, subscribe, um, and, and watch out for the other videos that are going to ask the other questions. And don't forget to always be genuine, have fun, and stay curious. <laughs> you love it when I do that, don't you? Yeah, it's very um, James Bond-esque. Yeah, thank you very much. That's very kind. I'll take that as a compliment. But then again, I take everything as a compliment, so it's easy. Yeah, well, you're no one. Um... Oh, who's the actor for James Bond? Daniel Craig. Daniel Craig, yeah. You're no Daniel Craig. So oh, I'm no Daniel Craig, no, no. You're no Daniel Craig. I'm certainly no Sean Connery either. Or Idris Elba. <laughs> Don't get started on Idris Elba. We need to concentrate. You've got a day of work ahead of you.